Welcome back, players. Jack with 36 Cancel here, and today I'm going to talk about the 8 Standby Mushoku Tensei deck. Now, this is going to be both a deck tech and some reflections on my experience playing it, so pardon the different style, it's just something I'm spitballing. But let's get right into an overview here. I really enjoyed Mushoku Tensei as a show, and I've been playing the deck basically since the set came out in English a few months back. Honestly, the anime has no right to be as good as it is considering the content, but I liked it enough not only to pick up the deck, but also to start a max rarity project on it, which, as you can see, is not quite far along yet, but we're getting there. I play the deck now in locals multiple times a week, in some online tournaments, and of course in Springfest. I haven't grounded out nearly as much as some other players, and I typically stay away from meta talk because I don't consider myself a very strong player, but if you're interested, let me tell you a bit about how it works, why it's good, and my experience piloting it. So 8 Standby Mushoku is likely one of the most oppressively good standby decks since Dao. Arguably, it's the best 8 standby deck in the format right now, since it not only excels at the standby game with incredible targets and supercharged power, but also has access to a really strong toolkit that 90% of standby decks have no claim to, like a level 1 advantage combo that has stage presence, amazing deck thinning and pinpoint searching, a rest counter, and of course, an inevitable and non-interactable endgame. That said, it also has its weaknesses, which can be exploited if you know how to play into it. So as I start talking about the cards here, I'll comment on some aspects that are both good and challenging about it. As you can see here on my mat, I have 50 cards sleeved up and a few on the sidelines. This is because the build I'm running is a bit experimental and I want to try adapting it a bit to the new field. I'll talk about the changes I made post Springfest and also cover the more conventional options to fill out the corners. However, the core of the deck is still very much intact, so let's discuss the real meat and bones of Standby Mushoku. It all starts with this level 0 Rudius. He gets plus 2k if you have 5 at hand and runs to center. His profile is a carbon copy of To Seize Freedom Armine, and with this mobility and power, a four of him is basically where you start building any Mushoku deck. Next we have Seductive Invitation Eris, and like, real talk, how the fuck is this even legal? If I wasn't going for max rarity, I wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. Anyway, she has a pretty basic profile, 2k, and on death you can pitch a card and top check 4 to add a level 1 or higher card to your hand. This is a very much nerf to Kotsky that's pretty standard now, that will be lackluster in most decks, but getting cards into your waiting room and having a pitch outlet for your standby targets is extremely necessary for 8 standby decks, so she's an automatic inclusion in most. Earlier builds we saw had her as a 3 of or even a 4 of, but now some have cut her down to a 2 of or even a one of in favor of other different tech. And speaking of tech, we have things I can teach you, Roxy, and arguably Mushoku's best brainstormer. She's a tap self salvage, and when you play a climax, you can choose a character and give it pay one twin drive. Don't underestimate this ability. The means to keep your stock clean and take advantage of the standby trigger is absolutely huge. For other builds, she also plays a different and arguably just as critical role, but we'll get to that later. For now, let's go on to some more tech. Scornful Eyes Roxy is the TD Climax Switcher and an integral one of in the 8 standby build. It has no other Climax filtering, so having a Switcher can turn a lame turn into straight money. She also gives something plus 1500 on play, which helps you outpace even the strongest backups in the mid game. Another one you see very often is offering a hand Rudeus. On play, he gives something plus 1k, and when you play a Climax, he bounces, gives another character 1k, and lets you reorder the top two cards of your deck. Obviously, things that bounce when you play a Climax that have abilities like this are absolute cash in a standby deck, but I think the most important part of this card is actually the top two reorder, because this can prevent first attack standby triggers, which is super, super clutch. It always guarantees that you won't miss an attack if you stand by to the center stage during your attack phase, and combined with the Roxy Brainstormer, it always lets you pay out a trigger Climax on a subsequent attack. I think this is one of the best, if not the best, synergistic standby level zeros. It's usually run as a one of, but personally I've found it so important that I've actually bumped it up to two. Further, in terms of optional yellow tech is Unraveling Heart Lilia. You can rest her and give one of your characters on reverse stock bomb, and also rest her to pitch an event and salvage a character. Now this gives you the ability to send away cards with hand on core and other shenanigans for good. However, you do have to outpower them, and I've found that the things I can generally outpower aren't the things I care about stock bombing, so I choose not to play it. She's also a back row level 0, which, in a standby deck, is a very competitive slot. This leaves us with two cards at zero. First up is Rugier, which at 2500 lets you put a card from your hand and your clock on play and search for a character. It's a cost zero Ricky that helps you color fix, so again, he's in most builds. As the field changed, you started to see more of him in decks, usually replacing the level zero Eris for deck slots. And last up, we have Jerkin' Off Roxy. 
when she's played, you can look at the top card and the bottom card of your opponent's deck, which is marginally useful for climax counting, but the main reason you'd play her is because on play, you can pitch a card from your hand and salvage an event called Amulet of Migard. Most decks play this event package, but more decks, including some of the top placing Mushoku decks in Springfest, have taken it out. Other options you see at level 0 are this Guild Receptionist, which is a mill 4 search ditch 1 brainstormer. It's another way to search and mill, which is great for standby, but I find that level 0 is too tight to run it. Another option you see is Rudius Grey Rat, the PR promo. If your opponent has a cost 0 alone in the center stage, you can put it into the waiting room when you play him. On death, you can also pay 2 and salvage. This is really good for dealing with enemy Rudy runners, and other good opening plays that are usually pretty tough to avoid having to deal with for multiple turns. Personally, I haven't found it super necessary for a one of slot because I feel I'd never have it when I wanted it, and I wouldn't want to expend a search for it early in the game, but I definitely see why it's a go-to for a lot of people. So now that we've covered the level 0, let's talk about the level 1. This is the real bread and butter of the 8 standby Mushoku deck, Sundere Eris. She's a 1-1 with a climax combo on a standby where on climax play you mill 2 and salvage an X with lower character where X is combined level of the cards you milled. This is a pretty good ability for any climax combo, much less a standby combo. Eris also sits at 7500 all the time, no matter what if you're playing a legal deck, making her an overstatted 1-1 standby target with an advantage standby combo that your opponent can't interact with. I'd argue that this is one of the most, if not the most, disgustingly, outrageously good standby combos ever printed, and it's a big reason why 8 standby Mushoku is such an oppressive deck. The fact that you had your climax combo on the 1-1 standby target you'd be going for anyway is just gross. Again, this is the engine at the heart of Mushoku's standby deck, so it's unquestionably a 4 of. To back this up, we have a 1-0 Ghislaine that gets plus 500 for each character, sitting at 6k on her own on a full stage. If you accelerate with her, she gets on reverse top check 4, independent of any climax combo. She's an amazing backup plan if you either A. Don't have enough stock to full field Eris, B. Need to mill your deck out even faster, or C. Don't have the Eris climax. This card lets you roll into a level 1 advantage engine without your advantage engine climax. It will be great on its own, but in this deck it's absolute hot fire, and generally at least a 2 of. Some decks also elect to run the generic 102k punch as a 1 or 2 of because, hey, you're trying to control the board, it's standby. I like it as a 1 of, but it's really up to you. The part where Mushoku decks really divide is the 1-0 event we talked about earlier, Amulet of Migard. You can't play it if you don't have a Roxy on the stage, but if you do, you can put it into your memory and search your deck for a character, then pitch a card. Then if it's in your memory when you level up, you can put it back into your waiting room and search out another character. Now this is two searches, a free discard outlet, and memory compression all in one card. When it came out, there was endless discussion as to how this card was one of the best, if not the best card, in the entire set. And it seems like a no-brainer, especially for a standby deck. However, again, some people, including top placing lists, have thrown it out the window. Why is that? Well, for one thing, the amulet package takes up a lot of space. Not only do you need to make sure you have a Roxy on the stage, but you also need to have blue in your clock, which has the problem in an 8 standby deck of not being red. And since most of your blue in this deck is either the Roxy you need to play to the stage so you can play the amulet, or the amulet you want to play, if your hand isn't great, this can land you in some really awkward turns. Rugeard can really help with this, but sometimes it doesn't turn out great. Amulet of Migard is an extremely powerful card that can sculpt your hand at multiple points in the game for free. However, in 8 standby, it does clash with the deck a bit. I was trying it as a 3 of with 2 Roxy Salvagers, but I was finding that I didn't have access to the event, or access to blue as much as I needed to, so I'm testing out bringing it back to 4. Now this is typically where the level 1 Mushoku standby package ends, however, you see that I'm playing a 1-1 Rudius as a 2 of. He's got a lot of text on him, but in this deck, he's a 1-1 early play stock bomb. This is, again, an experiment I'm trying out because I was finding that the deck's tool to deal with pesky early plays ironically didn't really work for the problems I was trying to solve, because they either have hand on core or get way too big for me to deal with before I play my level 3 Galanes, at which point it didn't matter. And being that the deck has a fair bit of yellow already, I thought I'd try him out as a way to get rid of things like Rusia and enemy Galanes. One of the things I like about him in this deck is that with a level 0 offering hand Rudius, you can reorder the top so you don't have a first turn trigger, then attack with him first, and have the potential to immediately replace him in the center stage if you hit a standby climax. So far, it's been a powerful option to have, but I definitely need to test more with it. So let's move on to level 2. Typically, level 2 is pretty small, but since this is an 8 standby deck, we have some level 2 targets. Mushoku's trademark level 2 target is Strong Body Ghislaine. At 5k, she gets plus 2k for each other character in the back row, and gives a global 1k. Obviously, this power stacking can get really out of control really fast, and being that your 1-1 standby combo already sits at 7500, putting this in the back row when you play the climax at level 1 is outrageous. 
However, most decks also run Fine Feathers Make Fine Birds Eris, which is just a generic 2-2-10k with hand on core and 2 soul. This offers some security and consistency on the board, especially in the center stage. People generally balance these two targets in the 4-5 combined range, usually leaning toward more lanes. However, another integral part of the Mushoku puzzle is the 2-1 rest counter. You have to pay 4 stock, but you get to completely negate an attack. Threatening a rest counter is a massive advantage in gameplay, even if you don't use it every time. It forces your opponent to play around the fact that you can shut down one of their attacks, and even likely one of their finishers, as long as you have 5 stock. Now 5 stock is a lot, but resources are no object when it comes to whether or not you lose the game. However, let me tell you the struggle I have with this card. Using it after level 2, but before I take my finishing turn may save me from going to level 3 in some very killable number of cards in my clock, but it also drains my stock a lot. Sometimes it lets me stay at level 2 for a turn longer and rebuild stock after I use it, but often I find that I need the stock to kill my opponent, and without that 5 stock, I really can't pay for the abilities on my finishers, so while I bought myself an extra turn, it buys my opponent 1-2 in a way. Alternatively, it may be necessary to use it or die after your level 3, however your finisher doesn't leave you with enough stock to use it after your opponent god cancels. Now most would say that the idea is to have both enough stock to use it effectively, stay at level 2, and still have enough stock to use your finisher. However, I found that if I'm in that kind of position in the mid game, I'm already pretty ahead and the rest counter is very much a win more, and if I'm behind and need to use it to slow my opponent down, I'm behind in resources too, meaning that it's almost too taxing to be effective. All that said, I think the best part of having the rest counter in this package is being able to threaten it. Even if it's brutal for you to use, your opponent still needs to sculpt their strategy around it to an extent, and that's powerful on its own. Now another counter that may need some playing around with is Sword God Style Ghislaine. This is a pay to and sacrifice a character anti-change backup. The cost, again, is pretty brutal, but having an answer to early plays that can be problematic isn't a bad thing. You'll notice I ended up taking this out of my build, because again, this card wasn't really solving the problems I wanted it to. But that's generally everything you'll see at level 2, so let's move to level 3. So again, there's the core of the level 3 and the tech options. Let's start with the stuff that really doesn't change. Strong Swordsman Ghislaine is the undisputed finisher of the 8 standby deck. Base 9k, during your turn, she gets plus 5k if you have a full stage, and heals on play. Her climax combo of course, on a standby, lets you on attack, pay 2, and burn 2. And finally, and arguably the most critical, during her battle, on your turn, your opponent cannot play backups or events. Now, pay 2 burn 2 isn't the most amazing finishing ability. In fact, it's a bit lackluster. However, where Ghislaine shines is her absolute inevitability. Your opponent can't interact with this card at all if you have a full stage during your turn, so you're guaranteed to be able to pay the cost and perform the combo regardless of what your opponent has up their sleeve. And of course, she's immune to Mushoku's own rest counter. Her massive power during your turn is almost a side note compared to this, but it does pretty much write any battle opponent's fate in stone since your opponent can't back them up anyway. This Gawain, to me, is a combination of really mediocre to good abilities that all happen to be on one card, thus increasing its strength exponentially. And of course, this climax combo lets us run 8 standby, so there's not much to say about her other than, yeah, she's a 4 of and she's really good. The second absolute staple in the level 3 game is Talented Swordsman Paul. Paul may be trash, but this card is not. Base 8500, he gives all characters, including himself, plus 1500 if he's in the center stage. He also has a built-in pay 1 twin drive ability, which is pretty neat. The ability that sets him apart though, is that when you cancel during his battle, you can mill the top card of your deck. If that card you milled has a soul trigger icon, you can pitch a card in your hand and reflect the amount of damage you are about to take. Paul is a great standby target for an attack phase trigger because he immediately adds power to the front row, and on your opponent's turn creates a big problem, which is that they might end up taking damage on their turn. Even if you stock bomb or bottom deck Paul with an anti-early play, you'll still risk taking the damage because the ability happens before battle takes place. So obviously, Paul is crazy good and an absolute staple for the 8 standby Mushoku deck. In fact, Paul is so good that when players drop the amulet package or cut down on other parts of the deck, they take the more conventional 2 copies of Paul and go up to 3 or 4. So now, we go into the tech options. Most decks will run 1 or 2 copies of this card, Migrant Mage Roxy. She's a plus 2k back row buffer that also lets you give a character pay 1 twin drive when you trigger a climax. And on play from hand, you can draw 2 pitch 2. Level 3 back rows are pretty standard in standby decks, and since this one also keeps your stock clean, she's widely considered an absolute staple. In my deck, I'm experimenting with taking her out for more deck space to focus on other parts of my toolkit, as when I played her, I found that, again, she didn't really solve any problems I needed her to, and 90% of the time, I would much rather have stood by a Paul or Ghislaine. But don't look at me for meta deck advice, I'm just spitballing here. 
There are two other tech options that some decks elect to run, and some decks don't, but it's a lot more valued across the field. I'm not running either of these, but here they are for your consideration. The first is Tomboy Sylphie. She has a lot of text on her, but in this deck she's a pay 1 stock swap on play, making her a 3 cost level 3 stock swap that gives you a body with 2 soul. Sometimes you just want to stock swap. It's expensive and off color for the deck, but there are situations where this can swing the game hard. The other option is Daughter of the Boreas Family, Eris, which is a 2 or less climax early play. She sits at 11k and on play you reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a character or an event that nobody runs, you get to burn for one. Now this becomes very interesting because once she gets reversed in combat, you can pitch a card from your hand and return her to your hand. This potentially lets you recycle the burn ability and not lose out on your early play. It's a neat option for some additional pinpoint damage, and it can help you stabilize board. I found that I never really wanted to pay stock for it, but plenty of people think it's great. Alright, so that covers the actual cards in the deck. And with all that explained, I'd like to talk about my experience playing it so far. Now many people look at Mushoku Standby as a more consistent and stronger standby deck, and that's true. The deck has tools that let you plus, filter, and exercise an amount of deck control that almost no other standby deck has access to. You can mill out your deck far easier and far faster than other standby decks, get cards to your hand for absolutely free, and you have powerful options for dealing with less conventional threats your opponent might throw your way. But all that said, I think that after playing it for a while, that at its core, it's still very much an 8 standby deck that can suffer from the same issues as other 8 standby decks. Because a lot of these cards have abilities that work very well on the board and very badly when they're stuck in your hand, you can still break out more often than you'd expect if you go in thinking that Mushoku is a more unique package that completely cures this problem. It still does suffer from the biggest drawbacks of 8 standby decks, like for example getting level stuck. Regiard helps with this a bit, but if you do a lot of early cancelling at 0 and don't go into level 1 with a lot of climaxes left, you're going to have a tougher time milling out your deck and since most of your triggers are gone, you can't really get your engine online for a while. This can be devastating when your opponent starts throwing 1k1s at you in the mid game and you don't have enough power to even keep your center stage occupied to mitigate some damage. Which brings me to another drawback that is both immediately and not immediately obvious. The deck's inability to punish bad compression. Now Mushoku has a lot of two soul beaters that come out in the second half of the game when they untap after your first turn at level 1. This, however, is generally going to be at a very late stage of your opponent's first deck or possibly even early into their second deck. Since the first deck is the toughest to compress, one of the strongest moves you can do in Wise 4s is slam some damage if you see a lot of your opponent's climaxes out of their deck before they get to refresh into a more compressed deck state. Well, despite having a lot of triggers, Mushoku has no soul on its climaxes, so even if your opponent has, like, no climaxes in their deck, you're still going to be swinging for 1s and 2s no matter what early on as long as you're not making direct attacks. Often, this can mean you can't put pressure on your opponent when you need to and end up behind in the damage race, having to expend resources to keep up that would be better saved for the late game. The myriad of twin drive abilities that you can activate in this deck, and of course the generous amount of triggers do help this, but it's definitely something that all standby decks suffer from when going against the more fair 1k1 decks, and Mushoku doesn't escape this. And finally, despite being a standby deck, Mushoku still can be quite stock hungry. Your finisher is a little expensive to use in multiples, and of course the rest counter is super taxing. You also end up paying early stock for your level 1 heiress, because after all, she is a 1-1, and you're not always going to magical Christmas land your way into two standby heiresses at level 0 and also have her climax when you untap at level 1, so it's a resource that has to be carefully managed. However, while the deck suffers from the same issues as many other 8 standby decks with less tools and tricks, it also benefits from these tools' strengths. High rolling with this deck is insane. It's not going to be every game, but when you manage to compress yourself to a point where you're triggering standby each turn and also cancelling damage, the deck is incredibly hard to deal with. If Mushoku gets a damage lead or a healthy state of stage control, it's a huge uphill battle to fight it. The rest counter and the deck's ability to refresh after a set of strong cancels and triggers make for an extremely difficult combination to face for any opponent, more so than a lot of other conventional 8 standby decks. You can also climax swap into your combos, and use Amulet to totally sculpt your hand for exactly what you need to take the upper hand in the mid-game. I've noticed that with Mushoku, when it rains it pours, which of course is the truth with many 8 standby decks, but with Mushoku especially since it can back up the crazy board control it has with great deck control and counters. Which ironically brings me to another cool thing about the deck, its ability to almost completely abandon its center stage in favor of an explosive endgame. If you're facing an opponent who for some reason has characters you can't deal with, you can use your deck's tools to compress and build stock. In short, the deck doesn't fold because you break its board. 
In fact, far from it. No matter how many times you crack Mushoku's stage, it can always answer you in the end with a triple Ghislaine turn that you can do nothing about, and it has the ability to compress enough to be prepared by the time you knock them to level 3. This is a huge departure from other 8 standby decks, where without control of the board, they have very few ways of gaining ground and quickly fall behind as they try to field bodies, and if you pick up Mushoku, this is definitely something you should keep in mind. Of course, this still won't help you against the god cancels on the final turn, which I learned in Springfest, but unless you find a way to delete all your opponent's climaxes, nothing really will. Now this is far from everything to say about the deck, and there are a lot of players who piled it a lot better than me that can give you better insight, but this is about where I want to wrap it up, and I hope you at least got some useful information for the actual deck tech portion. I also hope you enjoyed a slightly different style of deck tech from my usual fare. Because I've been piloting the deck a lot, especially in practice for spring and summer tournaments, it's been on my mind a lot, and I just had some general thoughts that I thought would be somewhat productive and informative to people who were thinking about picking up the deck. I still think it's very fun, because at the end of the day, I very much live for those stupid high roll games even if it's not always going to happen. Does that make me a bad player? Yes it does. But I'm having fun, which means it's basically impossible to fault me for it. And while you do need to own the fact that playing more for your own fun and playstyle, rather than adhering to a meta thoughts and an optimization, won't make you a great player, getting the most out of the game, no matter how you play, is absolutely the most important thing. Have a good one, players. I know Mushoku is kind of yesterday's news right now, but I've got some super cool Hall Live content in the works. I had to wait for some stuff to come in the mail, but I think you'll find it was worth the wait. So look forward to that, and as always, thanks for watching. Peace.